Oh, hello there. People of the world, hello. And welcome. Oh me, oh my. It's marketing. As a foreign language, May 27th, I'll be your instructor. My name is Senor K, uh, and this will be entirely in Spanish. Benvenido a nuestra lección. Uh, you are now listening to a pure Spanish show. Uh, your brain has somehow translated every word I'm saying into English. Today on Marketing as a Foreign Language, Facebook clarifies guidelines around music usage in video posts. Huh. Copyright? <laughs> Anyone? New report suggests Facebook, again, ignored research, which indicated that it contributed to societal division. <gasps> politics. You couldn't possibly talk about politics. Five Google pay-per-click tricks to save your business. Cashola. Money. Dinero. Google Search Console updated with Core Web Vitals report. Oh, it sounds so boring, and yet it is so important. Where do we begin? Well, I suppose right here. Facebook clarifies guidelines around music usage in video posts. Facebook is looking to clarify its rules around how creators are allowed to use music in their content, while it's also adding a new indicator in Facebook and Instagram live streams to help people avoid potential copyright issues. Andrew Hutchinson at A. D. Hutchinson. Let's go. What can we possibly do about the copyright infringement? I would love nothing more, trust me, than to stream gorgeous sounds. I'm not sure if you've heard about the band The Fat Rat. Have you heard about Fat Rat? you got to get into The Fat Rat. If you're like me and you're old and you've got gray hairs, you still need to YouTube the fat rat and give it a multiple couple couple listens. Why do you want to do that? Well, because oh me oh my, you might want to keep this plugged in. In three, two, uh, it's actually right here. In case you're wondering if we're streaming live, um, there's there's an example. Uh, yes, listen to the fat rat, and also Twitch streamers don't seem to care. Nobody seems to care. I've heard. Bon Jovi. I've heard all sorts of random artists who clearly uh, would, per well, perhaps their companies would not be thrilled about their music being streamed. From Facebook, quote, we want to encourage musical expression on our platform while also ensuring that we uphold our agreements with rights holders. These agreements help protect the artists, songwriters, and partners who are the cornerstone of the music community, and we're grateful for how they've enabled the amazing creativity we've seen in this time. That to me sounds like <laughs> sounds like nothing. Facebook established a new set of agreements with music publishers back in 2018, and since then it's been looking at new ways to integrate song snippets and music options into its various tools. Can we use music or can we not music? Can we not music? Are we gonna get sued forever if we have a clip? on a YouTube video uh, or not. But at times, users do still face removals and challenges because of the sounds they include in their uploaded clips. Well, if the worst thing that's gonna happen is a removal, this is what I hear uh, about streaming anyway. So if I'm streaming right now, and there's, you know, right now we've got, what, 42,000 people watching? So the, 40, the small town of people that's currently watching the show, uh, if I'm streaming really hard for them to get in here, and do anything about it, shut us down. But when it turns into a live video, yes, I can see that live video going away. To avoid this, Facebook has outlined four guidelines for permissible, oh me oh my, music use, covering both Facebook and Instagram. Bullets, oh, oh, uh, how I love a bulleted list. Bullet number one, there are no limits on things like music in stories or traditional musical performances. So a live artist or band performing, that's good because I am in six, projects right now. They're all solo projects, but uh, six musical projects um, currently running um, through my brain. The greater the number of full-length recorded tracks in a video, the more likely it may be limited. A stream may be interrupted. Oh man, they can interrupt streams. Would you look at that? Parts of your video could be muted <gasps> or could be removed entirely. Well, if they're not going to sue us into the ends of the earth, then perhaps it's not the end of the world. Shorter clips of music are recommended. Huh. Yeah, but what if we don't want 
shot clips. Are we really abusing the artists when we play their songs on our YouTube videos? Are we? Hmm, an age old debate. To be sure, there should always be a visual component to your video. Recorded audio should not be the primary purpose of the video. So if it's playing in the background, I guess it's playing in the background. I was gonna play Hannah Montana music for this video, but then I thought, will it interrupt the stream and will our now 427,000 viewers uh, not be able to enjoy this delectable content? Those pointers make sense and align with general copyright rules. Oh, the bullets are over? Ugh, they were so much fun. Though the lack of limits in stories or on recordings of live performances is a little surprising. I'm hoping that I can pull out uh, the cord in my headphone at least two more times. Uh, that's my goal for this particular show. The general copyright rule of thumb here is that you can use elements of music so long as it doesn't equate to a significant amount of the original work. Really? You can use elements of music so long as it doesn't equate to a significant amount of the original work? That is ridiculous. This is lawyer speak. There is a question around what qualifies as significant. Yeah. I suppose there would be in this context, but Facebook's rules here pretty much align with that broad approach. Facebook says that these guidelines apply across live and recorded video and for all types of accounts. You know what I mean? To me, it sounds like wild, the wild west. And it sounds like there's a ton of people that are just doing it and going whatever. To help avoid issues, Facebook advises that creators can use its free sounds library. Have you, have you gone to a free sounds library have you? You ready? You ready for a free sounds library? Can we meme that? Can someone make a meme? Yes, my beatboxing skills out of control. Uh, free sounds libraries are garbage in my experience. So hashtag no, hashtag uh, moving right along. Farewell article. New report suggests Facebook ignored research which indicated that it contributed to societal division. Do people contribute to societal vision or is it is this Facebook's fault? Has Facebook made us more divided and more likely to take sides in political debate? This is our second article from Mr. Hutchinson. Oh my goodness. It certainly seems that way with us against them. Tribalism now a part of almost every major discussion. Even medical advice has seemingly become a point of political contention in the modern age, according to Mr. Hutchinson. Of course, such division has always existed, at least to some degree, but has Facebook, oh, evil Facebook, and social media more broadly made it worse than ever before? Are they exacerbating this problem? This became a key point of discussion in the aftermath of the 2016 U.S. presidential election, which suggestions, with suggestions that Russian troll farms, don't you love that? That actually is the name of one of my six solo projects right now. Russian Troll Farms. It's actually uh, banjo heavy. Um, so check me out on Spotify. And political activist groups had been using Facebook to influence voter opinions through targeted manipulative posts and ads. Is that possible? Could our minds really be changed by the content displayed in our news feeds? Of course they could. If something ac comes across as a fact, and it's not a fact. Uh, survey says manipulation. Past research has shown that indeed voter action can be influenced, surely not, by what people see on Facebook. And according to a new report by the Wall Street Journal, Facebook is well aware of this, with the social network conducting a study back in 2018 which found that the platform's notorious algorithms, quote, exploit the human brain's attraction to divisiveness. Oh, why do we love it so much? Why do we love picking teams, man? Why do we gotta be on this team versus that team? I have a theory. It's because we don't use the left and right side of our body equally. People use the mouse with both hands. He'll thank me later. So what did Facebook do in response? As per the Wall Street Journal, which he just says WSJ. So cool, Hutchinson. He's so cool. Mr. Zuckerberg, and this is a quote, and other senior executives largely shelved the basic research and weakened or blocked efforts to apply its conclusions to Facebook products. Is it because they love money? Facebook policy chief Joel Kaplan 
Joel Kaplan in the house, anybody? Everyone loves Joel Kaplan, who played a central role in vetting proposed changes, argued at the time that efforts to make conversations on the platform more civil were paternalistic. And that is one syllable too many. Hey, don't try to, uh, don't try to father our Facebook posts. Do you mind? It's a bit paternalistic said people familiar with his comments. Ooh, people familiar with his comments. Really, the revelation is not surprising, not so much in the context that Facebook might choose to ignore it, but in the first point that Facebook can exacerbate division. How is this news? This is obvious. Does the sun rise in the morning? Is the sky blue most of the time? Do I love burritos? All of these things are clearly facts. Am I wildly popular in the Scandinavian countries and Uruguay? Yes. I'm huge, huge in Uruguay. Indeed, Facebook's own executives have indirectly pointed to such in their various comments on the topic earlier this year. Facebook's head of VR and AR, Andrew Bosworth, B -b -b Bosworth published a long explanation of his personal thoughts on various Facebook controversies, including the idea that Facebook increases societal divides. Here's my problem with this article. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, me, oh, my. Yeah, Facebook influences opinions. Five, Google, pay. Oh, and they knew it. Does Facebook care enough to do anything about it? I mean, this is this to me is a free speech argument, is it not? Money in politics. You know, if you got $16 billion and you want to spend, you know, $5 million, on a Facebook ad campaign, how do you stop that? If the information is blatantly false, how easy is it to prove that something is blatantly false? It's tricky business. I think human censorship is just not gonna fly. I think we're gonna end up with super weird AI censorship in short order where, the, where there will be a percentage that an algorithm will assign to the likelihood of a particular story being true based on beyond comprehensible amounts of understanding from a machine, basically. So we're using, we will use, if we're not already, machine learning to basically allocate a score to the trustworthiness of any particular thing. And then people, if they get upset with it, will have to be upset with an algorithm, which is smarter than them. It's like me trying to get as good as AI in chess. It's never gonna happen. No human is ever going to be able to do it. We're toast, it wins. Um, and so we're just going to rely on these sorts of methods moving forward because clearly we can't sort this out ourselves because we love teams. I'm the red team. I'm the blue team. You're wrong. No, you're wrong. We need a referee, basically. And I think a machine referee is probably the next step in human evolution. Anyone excited about that? Anybody? Anyone? Machine referee? Determining what's a fact? with 17 billion percent more accuracy than a human being. Five, Google pay-per-click tricks to save your business. That cashola. Oh my gosh. Jason Parks, the CEO of Media Captain. Oh man, I wish I was a media captain. <sighs> a penny saved is a penny earned. Oh, by the way, this is a seven minute read. You gotta love that. You gotta love that articles nowadays are saying, look, look, dude, it's just seven minutes, man. It's like a seven minute video. Do you understand me? It's seven minutes, just read. Can you please read my articles? Just seven minutes. Thank you, uh, Jason Parks. Uh, the aforementioned quote by Benjamin Franklin holds true across all industries, especially digital marketing, where a simple mistake can cost you a Benjamin Franklin. That's a hundred bucks. In a heartbeat. Oh, me, oh my, he is the media captain. Uh... Negative keywords, ad schedule, keyword selection, God, board already, quality score. Always be just fine. I'll do this article. Under protest, we're going to talk about this article. Negative keywords. The word like free. If you don't want someone to type in free attorney, then you add the negative keyword free. So when they type in free attorney, your ad doesn't pop up because you do really want someone typing for free attorney and you clicking 40 or spending $40 for that click? Nope. Ad schedule. Ugh. 
Perhaps you only want to show your ad in certain days or during business hours when they're here. Yes, you can put your ads on schedules. Monday from 10 to 2. I talk about doing call only ads a lot. And you may as well do it from like, I don't know, 9.30 to 11.30, right? So if you do it from 9 to 5, anytime the phone rings, you think to yourself, oh, it could be a potential customer. You run over, oh, hello, how can I help you? Are you really going to take that call at 4.55 with the same energy that you would at 10? Probably not. At 4.55, you're sleepy. You need a nap, man. Hashtag nap. Hashtag work from home. Hashtag more napping. Hashtag cultural change for more napping. Anyone? Am I the only one who thinks naps are important? Add schedule. Yes. Get on a schedule. Duh. Keyword selection. Oh, wow. Turns out you want proper keyword selection. So are you telling me that if I'm a plumber and I'm running electrician keywords, that's probably dumb? Keyword selection, a common mistake in first setting up a pay-per-click campaign is when marketers don't know the difference between broad match, broad match, modifier, face match, and exact match keyword. Okay. Here's the deal. Uh, exact match keywords. If you type in an exact match into Google ads and you say plumber Las Vegas, they have to type in exactly plumber Las Vegas. Uh, there are other variations where like broad match with plumbers Las Vegas, this sort of thing, plumbers in Las Vegas. Um, so yes, you do want to make sure that you are targeting the correct keywords, but this is fairly sophomoric. Do you know that using the word sophomoric in conversation increases the punchability of my face by five points? That's so sophomoric. You know what, using the words aforementioned and sophomoric um, jumps my uh, face punchability score to a solid nine and a half. Uh, the aforementioned uh, pay-per-click uh, broad match uh, paragraph uh, felt to me to be a bit sophomore. Quality score, did you know that Google actually judges your keyword performance and you can see that on a grade scale of one to 10? This is called a quality score and according to Google, it is an estimate of how relevant your ads, keyword and landing page are to a user viewing your ad, yes. This is one of the things that if you are using a pay-per-click company, you can ask them, hey, can you please send me the quality score for the various ads that we are running? Um, ultimately, who cares about the quality score if the conversion rate is where you want it to be? This is to say, if you're running pay-per-click and the phone is ringing and you're making money, then who cares? But if you are not, then you may not want to say, hey, why isn't the phone ringing? Because they're simply going to say, well, because of these 42 reasons that are just going to confuse you and you can go back to them and you can say, por favor, dame. El score de calidad. Give me that. Quality score. Sí, sí. Gracias. Merci. Get that quality score. Always be testing. Ugh. I suppose if you're working with a pay-per-click company and things aren't going well, you can say, look, give me an update on new ads you're running. Right? Like, what are you doing? Are you running new ads? Are you A-B testing? This ad versus that ad. What ads are working? What's my highest converting ad? Are you measuring phone calls? If so, which ad is delivering the most phone calls? Can you track the exact phone call to that ad? If you can, let me listen to those phone calls. Do you see? It gets real complicated real quick. And we're done. We're done with this article. Google, this is actually interesting. Search console, ah. Uh, do we have to talk about Google Search Console? Ask the listeners. Oh, we're up to 146,000. Uh, viewers right now. Good stuff. Google Search Console updated uh, with Core Vitals report. I know this sounds so incredibly, unbelievably boring, but Google Search Console is the place. It's free uh, where Google gives you the most possible information about your website, your SEO, the clicks coming to your website from Google. It is the hub. It is everything. Google Search Console is something that you desperately want to bop around in. You're not going to break anything. If you have a website, you can add Google Search Console and you absolutely should. Ooh, one of my favorite uh, authors, Matt Southern, 16 minutes ago. Are you kidding? Look at this super fresh content. So fresh and so clean, clean. Google's core web vitals, a set of metrics deemed essential to delivering a good user experience, now have their own report in Search Console. Core web vitals. It's like a doctor stat. Stat we need. What do we need? We need help for our core web vitals. Can we get a respirator? Core web vitals were first introduced earlier this month as a way to measure the quality of the user experience provided by a website. Google considers these metrics critical to all web experiences. Critical, people, mission, critical, and is now providing site owners with an easy way to measure them. <sighs> Measuring core web vitals in Search Console. Google is rolling out core. Oh, you just said that. Replacing the speed report. 
here's my problem with articles nowadays. No one reads them. And so they say the whole thing in the first paragraph and then they repeat themselves. Replacing the speed report with the core web vitals report goes to show how Google's thinking has evolved regarding user experience. There's more to keeping users happy than having a site that loads fast. Okay, you've got my attention. Was it Hutchinson? No, we're on to Matt Southern. You've got my attention, Matt Southern. Let's go. In order to provide a good user experience, according to Google, a site needs to meet certain expectations for loading. Here we go. Interactivity. Interactivity. One more time for emphasis. Interactivity. Do people stay on your website? Why would they? Why? Why? Weshama? Por qué? Why would people stay on your website? This is the question. This is the 2020 question. Is it because there's a video that they're watching? Hello? How much time can someone possibly spend on one of your blog posts? How do you get them interacting with the site and coming back and visual stability? I don't even know what that means. With that said, let's take a look at what exactly are the core web vitals. These three metrics represent the 2020 core web vitals. Largest contentful paint? What? Have you ever seen this word in your life? Contentful? Largest contentful paint measures perceived load speed and marks the point in the page load timeline when the page's main content has likely loaded. What? Perceived load speed and marks the point in the page load timeline when the page's main content has likely loaded. Holy smokes the dokes. We're not even talking about the page going live. We're talking, we're talking pop filter. We are talking about when the main content has likely loaded. What? Huh, what? An ideal speed, obviously, everyone knows this, is 2.5. 2.5 segundos. First input delay measures responsiveness and quantifies the experience users feel when trying to first interact with the page. First input delay, interesting. So how long does it take for these visitors to get their click on? How long, camera, does it take? Oh, we're up to two million followers. Uh, watching the show, good stuff. First input delay, do they click and how long does it take? An ideal measurement is less than 100 seconds. If it's taking them longer than 100 seconds, they're probably not clicking anything at all. Are they clicking on your site? Why, 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 why would they? Cumulative layout shift measures visual stability and quantifies the amount of unexpected layout shift of visible page content. An ideal measurement is less than one second, I assume, less than 0.1 rather. Uh, if you got like a 94 ads and everything shifts all stupid, shifts all stupid, that might be a cumulative layout shift issue. Um, and for some reason, Search Engine Journal has nailed my fourth Spotify project name, which of course is cumulative layout shift. It's a death metal band. Why are these metrics more important than others? Google rationalizes choosing these metrics as the core web vitals because they capture important user centric outcomes are measurable and have supporting Lab diagnostic metric equivalence. How do you read the core web vitals report? Here's how you do it. You go to Google Search Console. You see that right there? Oh me, oh my. There it is. Gaze upon it. Core web vitals. Give that a click. If you don't have Google Search Console on your website, super easy to install it. Don't trip. All good. Give it a search. Add it. On the overview tab, you can toggle between poor, needs improvement, or good tabs. Ooh, who doesn't love an assortment of, assortment of tabs? From one of those tabs, click open report to see the page performance numbers for mobile and desktop. You can click on individual rows in the table and see details about URL groups affected by a specific issue. Oh, fun. A place to find problems. This is one of those things where if you are hiring a company, you go in here, you find problems, and then you send them like a two word email and you say, please revise or please investigate. And then the marketing team spends 19 hours that you never see trying to understand and wrap their heads around it. So if you want to hurt your internet marketing team, all you do is go to Google Search Console. The fact that you even have that is gonna scare them to death. And then 
you send them one of these reports that are brand new and no one has ever seen before. And you say, yeah, I was just looking at Google Search Console real quick. I just noticed that under the poor performance tab, we had, you know, it's, uh, like 13 syntax JSP.457 errors. So if you could just quick take a look at that, um, you may cause them to have a cardiac event, um, but uh, you may also get them to spend extra bonus time on your uh, campaign. Improving core web vitals. Google recommends fixing everything labeled poor first. Google recommends fixing everything labeled poor first. Seriously, for serious? Okay, we'll do the poor stuff first. That's smart. First, then prioritize what to do next based on issues affecting the most URLs. Non-technical users may need the assistance of a developer to fix specific issues. There you go. This is why I'm talking about the 42-12qp.rs the error. Oh, what's that? I googled it and it says that it says that it's a Taylor Swift song. Google says some of the most common page fixes. No, it's actually the new name of uh, the Tesla owner, Elon Musk. That's Elon Musk's uh, new kid's name. Google says some of the most common page fixes should include reduce your page size to less than 500 kilobytes. Okay. Limit the number of page resources to 50. Consider using AMP, accelerated mobile pages. Well, there you have it. There you have it. Let's take a look. Music. Can you probably stream music and get away with it? Yeah, probably. Do I want to do it? Do I want to mess with it on Send It Rising stuff? No, not for the company. Would I mess with it maybe in like a Twitch feed, you know, where you're just kind of playing around? Yeah, no one seems to care, um, but I'm not a lawyer and this is not legal advice. Uh, so as far as I can tell, they'll shut you down, maybe. There you go, it's the Wild West. I mean, how, much res how many resources does, you know, Twitch or Facebook want to allocate to having an algorithm that finds copyrighted music during live streams or video content and then mute it? Ugh, yikes. You know, at a certain point, is it possible that the proliferation of good music just refuses to be tied down throughout human history? Is it possible that even 2000 years ago, some dude played a song and some guy's like, I like that song and then started playing that song and then that song got popular? Is it possible that trying to restrict music is, is antithetical to the soul of humanity is it possible that you know if you're a band i know this is like the sin of sins to say exposure matters i get it i have friends who are professional musicians it's not easy but are ticket sales the primary driver of revenue now that the compact disc has gone by the wayside isn't it perhaps silly that we are attacking people for putting on tunes maybe it's just me New report suggests Facebook ignored research. Of course they did. Of course they did. Why would they change the fundamental revenue driver, which is ads? They can't mess with their ads, man. It's the same thing with Google. This is why Google hates when people buy links because Google sells links. That's all Google does. Google is a giant link selling operation. And so they want a monopoly on links and they've got it. They have a monopoly on links. And so Facebook has a monopoly on like banner ads, basically, you know, ads with pictures, that's their thing. And so, you know, they, uh, they need Russia to spend money because they don't want to figure out oh, if it's from Russia or Brazil or like, where can we serve ads? Like, don't, don't mess with us. Just let people spend money, put whatever they want on our platform, leave us alone. That's the incentive. And then, you know, come on, come what may in regards to, you know, the societal impact. You know, they can always just say, well, that's humanity for you. You know what I mean? So they have no incentive, zero. And fine, you can fight that fight and be angry and do whatever, or you could just not use Facebook. Or you could understand that when you're scrolling through Facebook, it's, you know, you just, I don't know, grain of salt, man. I'm not a big Facebook user. I'm just not. So I, I this whole like being influenced by Facebook sort of stuff, I don't personally use the platform that often. I don't like it that much, which I don't know, is that heresy? Maybe. Just don't like it. Uh, pay per click. Okay, fine. Negative keywords. Yes, you want them. Uh, ad schedule. I, I suggest running it for a time when you know they're going to call. Don't run it for the end of the day. Um, quality score. Talk to your provider about your quality score. It's worth, worth having a conversation. And then, yeah, this Google Search Console dealio is interesting to me. Um, if you do want uh, to dive into ranking better, this is the annoying technical stuff that you have to sometimes uh, take a look at. 
So Google Search Console updated with Core Web Vitals up Vitals Report. Check it out. Um, if you don't have Google Search Console, add that. Um, and then, actually, the best part of the show I saved it for last. Playing a lot of chess with my daughter, and uh, you know she wins. I let her win pretty much all the time. And uh, I do that because I love her very much, and I want her to have a good life, and I want other people to be the people that, uh, you know, win and make her feel bad. Um, and so I am okay with developing a passion in her. I want her to feel that rush of dopamine and endorphins that comes with winning. I want her to be attracted to winning at chess and to chase that feeling because it, what it'll do is it'll guide her through um, a series of experiences on planet Earth uh, that will create neural pathways for her that will help her solve problems in the future. And so there, of course, is an argument towards um, internet marketing, say, um, where if you want to make money for your small business and you're pushing through, someone may not be there for you to give you all that lovely winning <laughs> that you so desire. The entrepreneur's journey, obviously, when you're a bit older, is getting used to the fact that there is no pillow for you there. There is no one looking over you to help you just win a lot and have that lovely experience of feeling great about it. It's possible that when you open your business, it's just failure for four months. You throw the coronavirus on top of it and it gets real bleak. So in a way, as an adult, as a professional, as an enlightened Maslow's hierarchy of needs, self-actualized uh, person, perhaps, you need to assume that role internally. This is to say, if no one else is gonna give you a pat on the back, give yourself a pat on the back. Let yourself be the person who congratulates yourself when you're doing all right, because the entrepreneur's journey is very isolating. It can be very difficult to share these experiences with other people and to receive empathy. Even if you talk to other entrepreneurs, they are also in their own little bubble. And so, in my experience, entrepreneurs are can be a bit of islands. And so give yourself a pat on the back for the incredible work you're doing. Uh, thank you so much for listening to the show. I hope you're learning a thing or two or seven. Um, and do check out my six Spotify band projects, especially the death metal one um, and uh, the banjo work I've, I've been doing lately. Do my banjo. It's just off the hook. Kill it on the banjo. Also, I'm coming out with a solo harpsichord record shortly. So if you're big into the harpist chord, uh, please give me a shout out. Oh, by the way, during the live show, if you want to hit that chat box and say, hey, Kellen, I like dandelions uh, because they're yellow. That's totally fine with me. You can say my favorite kind of sandwich is a delicious one. That's cool. Say something in the chat box, people. Communicate. Comunicame conmigo. Habla conmigo. I want to hear from you. So love you. Proud of you. We're going to see you tomorrow. If you can even believe such a thing is true. Uh, on episode, oh me, oh my, 11? <laughs> 10 episodes in already? Incredible. We'll see you tomorrow for episode 11 of Marketing as a Foreign Language. Tell a